I'm not what you'd call a Devil May Cry fanatic, in that the only prior game I've played in this series was Devil May Cry 4. I had a lot of fun with it, but even on the easier difficulty setting, I was having a rough time. Even so, there was a lot to the combat I enjoyed, and I suppose Nero did his job of introducing a new player to the franchise. It seems this impression was not quite universal, however, as Capcom later tapped Ninja Theory into developing a reboot of the franchise, including a transformation of series protagonist Dante. While I'm not a long-time fan, I, too, was disappointed to see the Han Solo of video game characters transformed into some gritty anti-hero designed to appeal to... teenagers, I guess? Instead of being a lovably cocksure scoundrel, a rogue with a heart of gold, he was marketed as an arrogant jerk with attitude. He went from being a hero that stands out amongst the crowd of grimdark protagonists, to Dante as imagined by Todd McFarlane. Even so, a story is just a part of what makes a game a game, and at times an optional part at that. I also like to try to divorce a game from its influences and predecessors in order to tackle it on its own terms. Does the Devil May Cry reboot still pack a killer punch? Does this new Dante stand his own ground? If the prior entries did not exist, would this be the game to kick off an entirely new series? In this analysis, I will be discussing both gameplay and story spoilers. I'll try to avoid giving away too much, but in order to fully analyze it, I will be bringing up end-of-game material. If the marketing for DMC gave you the impression that Dante was supposed to be some cocky little crap maggot that spends too much time making sure his hair is just so perfectly unkempt, well, that's because he kind of is that sort of jerk. At least under certain circumstances. In other circumstances, Dante is a sensitive, caring male, badly waxing poetic about what it means to truly feel alone in a world full of demons. These two sides of Dante are constantly at odds with each other throughout the game, making it hard to really figure out just what it is that drives our protagonist. Dante and his brother Virgil are Nephilim, the spawn of an angel and demon. The union of their demon father, Sparta, with angelic mother Eva was viewed as treason by the demon king Mundus, and as such, Mundus chose to punish the traitor demon by killing his wife and banishing Sparta to... not Earth. Before his banishment, Sparta managed to separate his sons and wipe their memory, leaving each of them with a blade to call their own. It turns out Nephilim are the only thing that can slay a demon king like Mundus, Though, no one never really specifies why. The catch is that Mundus is only aware of Dante, and has no clue as to Virgil's existence. With no memory of his childhood, Dante spends much of his time living in an orphanage until he realizes some of the employees are demons. This starts a life of violence, rebellion, and... casual... sex. Huh. Your eyes really do open up to evil everywhere. I took a stand, fought back, killed. No matter the consequences. So I chose my path and I lived by it. But after all that anger, violence, and death, you have to dig deep. Dig into your own heart. To see if you're still sane. Or if you can still call yourself... human. For a guy that's trying to tell a sad story of loneliness and questioning one's sanity, he looks awfully happy to be in the middle of an angelic orgy. In fact, he seems pretty happy with life as a whole, as opposed to bitter to spend so many years fighting a worthless, pointless battle. Based on how the game starts, you'd think he was capitalizing on the demon's control of society, allowing him his indulgences. I understand the ideas for Dante to develop as a character, to go from an insufferable, self-serving bastard to an actual hero type, but the transformation needs to make some logical sense. If he's a selfish person with no interest in rebelling against the demons, then restoring his memory should merely give him fuel for a selfish quest for vengeance. Again, though, it makes little sense as he's enjoying life well enough as it is, and he really didn't remember his parents anyway. Yet we're then told that Dante isn't happy with life, or at least came to terms with it somehow. He doesn't seem like someone that has been forced to compromise his values or desires, but because the game tells us he has, we're supposed to just buy into his story progression. In truth, Dante is merely written to be a different sort of male power fantasy than we're used to. If Marcus Phoenix is the ideal of Emilio Estevez from The Breakfast Club, then Dante is the ideal of Judd Nelson. Disrespectful to authority, living on the fringes of the system instead of being a slave to it, and just having a good time making fun of everyone. I like it rough. Who invited you, fat ass? I'm your prime date, you ugly sack of shit. Hey, Bob. Put a spin on this. Now there is a face only a mother could love. Poor mother. I don't know my mother, but if you're calling me a son of a bitch, you wouldn't be the first. Dante's transformation is honestly never really truly complete. 
Right to the end, he's a smarmy, prideful loudmouth. The only real difference is he treats Cat with a bit more respect and is willing to fight for humans, yet the character remains the same. It's hardly a better character than we had previously, and that's a great shame. Let's talk about visual metaphors for a moment. A visual metaphor is intended to convey an idea visually, communicating ideas about a person, place, thing, or even action without having to explain them to you. Take, for example, Cat's hoodie. Cat, who serves as Virgil's assistant and helps Dante through his journey, does not want to be noticed. She wants to remain inconspicuous. She also does not open up personally to Dante, keeping much of her history a secret. Once she does decide to share her past with Dante, to open up to him, she lowers the hood. This is a visual metaphor that communicates how closed off Cat is. She's not a very outgoing person. She is, if anything, the opposite of Dante. While Dante has no problem shooting his mouth off and talking about himself to Cat, she is much more secretive. That is, until she lowers the hood, indicating that she is now willing to risk emotional vulnerability. So what we can gather is Cat is a very closed off individual that would like to avoid drawing attention to herself. So why in the bloody ding-dong ditches of hell is she walking around in hot pants with her tits spilling out of her top? Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with the female body or a bit of fan service, but there needs to be context and it needs to make sense for the character. People will look at a woman showing off as much skin as Cat is, a fact that only works if Cat is, intentionally, say, trying to draw attention away from Dante, a scenario that never really occurs in the game in this form, I might add. This is why people complain about depictions of women in video games. It doesn't make sense for a quiet, withdrawn character like Cat to have her top unzipped enough to show cleavage and to be wearing short shorts. If you're going to have fan service, at least allow it to fit the character. Make Mundus' squeeze the fan service instead of... Ah. This begs the question of what purpose Cat really serves. In the end, she's Dante's tie to humanity, a strange thing seeing as Dante had never known before that he was Nephilim. Having lived so long as a human and with other humans, he clearly already has that tie. Even so, it is because of Cat that Dante continues to emphasize with and chooses to defend humanity and its freedoms. So in order to get the player to empathize with and care about Cat, they portray her as... a whimpering, simpering little puppy. This is a woman that has willingly chosen to fight on the front lines of a war against demons, alongside Virgil and Dante. She is also intelligent enough to mix spell components into a spray can, rendering them portable and easily usable. She is also, somehow, able to withstand torture at the hands of demons while saying nothing. But under pressure and without brave, masculine Dante to protect her? Whimpering, simpering little puppy. <sighs> hey, at least they tried. Drinking soda makes you stupid and frat. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Demons being in control of all aspects of human life, from consumerism to corporate culture and even our news, is pretty trite an idea. Yet a skilled hand can still criticize these aspects of our society in a clever, satirical, and condemning manner. Ninja Theory didn't, but, you know, they could have. Instead, the commentary plays out as if pulled from the notebook of a high school student way too influenced by angry metal and industrial bands. Humans are sold a soft drink that promises to help them lose weight and increase sexual prowess, but it really makes them docile, stupid, and lazy, actually made from some horrific succubus thing. Kind of like that episode of Futurama that had the same plot, only better. Sorry, don't shoot the messenger. Corporate culture, a tad more subtle in its presentation here, is hell. Quite literally. People are all hung up in chains and clawing like the walls, and yeah, it's pretty much hell. Perhaps the laziest, most juvenile target of all is Raptor News Network, an obvious stab at Fox News and its conservative leanings. It's like Stephen Colbert of his extremist personality were serious rather than being a self-aware joke. It really is as if a teenager wrote this story, or perhaps carefully constructed it to appeal to a youthful rebel, with some notion that only he can see through society's guise and uncover the ugly truth within. With each major environment providing some poor critique of society, you'd think the nightclub level, of all places, would be rife of criticism for sex or drug culture. Yet no such thing happens. Once you realize that sex and bass-heavy music are being celebrated, begin to get a really clear picture of the creative lead's values and personality. The saying goes that if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. I'd rather adjust that to, if you don't have something clever to say, then shut up and get a real writer to tell the story.
Making a game easier does not necessarily make it more accessible. In fact, making a game easier can simply make it more boring. This is what Capcom and the designers of Devil May Cry failed to understand. A game can achieve accessibility by allowing the player multiple options based on a limited number of interactions. For example, all Mega Man can really do is jump and shoot, yet there are layers of depth added based on using these simple interactions to evade enemy attacks and aim for an enemy's weak point. Devil May Cry has two separate attack buttons for their primary weapon, the attack button for the secondary weapon, and the jump button. Two of the triggers are also dedicated to evasion. However, if the player holds down one of the secondary triggers, use an alternate primary weapon replacing the secondary weapon with a grapple, one of the primary weapon you bring up with the triggers, changes based on pressing the D-pad... There are two reasons video games are inaccessible to non-gaming enthusiasts. In the case of shooters, it's because aiming and moving with two separate controls simultaneously takes time to adjust to. In every other game, it's because there are simply too many damn buttons to keep track of. Add to this the required situational awareness involved, of needing to equip the big axe when armored or shielded enemies come out, or using the scythe when surrounded by a large number of mooks. Later on, the game adds two similar but slightly different enough weapons to pile on the complexity, which is only further made overwhelming with the number of combos that the player can purchase. The real misunderstanding is that games like the original Devil May Cry were designed to be mastered, and Ninja Theory merely took away any reason to try mastering those systems by making it easier. If you're the kind of player that enjoys action games but doesn't have the patience to deal with mastering the mechanics, then yes, DMC is a perfectly fine game. In fact, I'd say it's pretty great. While the button combinations seem complex at first, each weapon follows the same format of basic attack and vertical attack, responsible for launching foes high into the air or slamming them back down to the ground. Everything else is a gun or a grapple acting as a secondary ability. Swapping between each weapon or mode of attack is determined simply by the triggers. Complex at first? Certainly, but the game wastes no time introducing these concepts within the first hour and at a decent enough pace. Anyone with experience playing video games will be able to grasp the basics no problem. More foes will be introduced throughout the game that will require the player to swap between weapons and fighting styles, but you'll never be forced to learn anything like difficult combo chains. This could be considered a good thing or a bad thing depending on what sort of games you enjoy. DMC still manages to provide incentive to experimenting and properly learning the mechanics. Smacking your foes into environmental hazards, for example, or the boost in your ranking after swapping weapons or pulling off more specific combos and moves. By varying the approach, the player can gain greater currency with which to purchase upgrades and items, encouraging the player to learn the system a lot better. The real highlight here is Dante's pair of grappling hooks, a return to Nero's demon arm from Devil May Cry 4. They allow the player to leap across the battlefield or to yank foes his way, escape from a desperate situation, or perhaps pull yourself to a foe so you can drop them to the ground. Being able to leap from foe to foe in a blur provides the perfect flow that makes DMC so satisfying. This new Devil May Cry provides the tools to empower the player and make them feel skilled at the game. However, it feels as if this empowerment is given too freely, at least compared to its ancestors. Sure, varying your approach and using all of your tools at your disposal will make it easier to climb the rankings, but it's still little challenge to climb as high as an A or S ranking and stay there. Enemies are also not as relentless as in previous games, making it easier to avoid damage and maintain that high grade. Even if you do get hit, your ranking only decreases slightly and can easily be padded back to its higher state. If you were drawn to the Devil May Cry series by its challenge and difficulty, then this removes any sense of pride or accomplishment. You don't earn that empowerment, that feeling of being a skillful badass capable of slaughtering hordes of demons. It's simply given to you, and there's less satisfaction in that for a certain kind of player. The changes are most obvious in the game's various boss battles. What should be a test of patience, skill, and reflexes are instead a game of spot the weak point, with each foe leaving themselves open in an obvious fashion only to be hacked and slashed at relentlessly. It's a basic repeat three times pattern that's supposed to gradually get more difficult, but the attacks are openly telegraphed, easy to dodge, and deal little in the way of damage. Most of the regular arena battles end up being more a test of skill than these boss fights do, which are easily the weakest part of the game. What really makes this game shine compared to its brethren, and to me at least, is how well they implemented grappling mechanics into non-combat situations. Fights are often broken up with platforming segments, relying on the player to use one grappling hook or the other to progress. Some of the more challenging courses require quick use of each type, knowing when to leap forward, to hook an object towards you, or yank yourself forward just at the right time. The cost of failure is a simple jump back to the last safe surface and a smidge of damage, allowing the player to jump right back in and try again. 
This also tends to act as a replacement for quick time events, whose usual intention is to combine gameplay with cinematic action sequences. Instead of forcing the player into a game of Simon Says, they are thrust into a situation where they must use the grapple or dash forward to escape some trouble or prevent some form of disaster. This combines well with a constantly transforming city, courtesy of the demonic world of Limbo, to keep the player exhilarated and invested while communicating where to go and what to do next very clearly. While the game has a shoddy camera during many combat sequences, this is where it behaves as it should, staying behind the player and always communicating where they need to go. Such platforms and courses also take the player off the beaten path, leading to hidden items and doors that unlock challenge rooms really testing the player's mettle. This, if anything, is what helps make DMC a strong title. While it may not live up to its predecessors in terms of challenge, there's still a lot on offer here that a wide variety of gaming enthusiasts can enjoy. The sad truth is that it doesn't really matter whether DMC is a good game or not, as everyone will be wondering if it's worse or better than the previous game. While it is good for a certain audience, it doesn't necessarily mean the previous audience and this audience will mesh well. What's more, Capcom's desires to make the game accessible may have been in vain, seeing as games like Dark Souls, Super Meat Boy, and roguelikes such as Splunky and FTL are growing in popularity. Challenge has become desirable, meaning a more difficult Devil May Cry might have actually been what the Doctor ordered after all. DMC was at least approached with a smaller team and developed on a budget, meaning Capcom had more realistic expectations. They had divided Devil May Cry into two franchises, an easier one centered around Nero while retaining the Dante-focused Devil May Cry for fans craving a challenge. They could have opened the franchise up to more fans. After all, it stands to reason that a fan of the harder Devil May Cry may still purchase the Nero game. After all, the mainline series would still exist. Instead, this new Dante supposedly designed for Western markets is repulsive to a lot of gaming enthusiasts, and many of the previous fanbase instead chose to ignore the title. Despite more realistic expectations, Capcom's experiment was a failure. So even if the game is good, and it would have launched a brand new series, which, without its predecessors, I believe it would have, is there really anyone around to give a damn?